All right, we're going to be looking at uh, several passages today. Um, if you would, go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 again. Matthew chapter 16, and uh, this great confession that uh, Peter gives to the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> at Caesarea Philippi, Matthew 16, uh, verse 18, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Um, I am taking the first uh, part of the lecture, the lecture today from this book, and I'm looking at page number 28. So if you want to follow along there, that's fine. I'm going to kind of use some of these ideas from the book and uh, then compare that with Scripture as well, with some other Scriptures as well. But the important phrase here in uh, chapter 16, verse 18, that we're going to look at today, I will build, I will edify my church. And many times in the New Testament, this phrase, this idea of edification is used in reference to the church at about 20 different times in Paul's writings. Uh, does he use this phrase, I will build, I will edify? So there's a number of ways that are given here in the book, and I think they're very important to understand. There's at least four ways. Actually, there's more than that. There's about seven ways, and we're going to look at uh, four in more detail. That uh, the church is edified through different things. So uh, I think it's interesting to point out that when Jesus is speaking here in uh, chapter 16, verse 18, he does not say, I will begin or I will originate, or I will start my church. He says, I will edify my church. I will build uh, my church. And so it's an important distinction, I think, that the church was already being established with his apostles, sorry, disciples at this point, and that then by the time you get to uh, Acts chapter 2, he's building the church some more. And I, he continues to build the church through a number of different steps. All right, how does he build the church? Well, the book puts it interestingly that he uses his vitamins. He, if you take your vitamins, you'll be healthy. And that's the picture of a healthy church is that they do what uh, the Bible says you're supposed to do to be edified or to be built up. Remember we used the example that this the, the idea of building and edifying is not necessarily of starting something or of necessarily even building a building. It's more of a body, of taking care of the body. And the more you work out, you're building your body. The more you exercise and so on, uh, that's how you stay healthy. You eat right. You take in the right things and so on in order to be healthy. And so Jesus said he's going to edify his church. So how does he do that? Well, the first one we're going to mention here is church discipline, with church discipline. And it's interesting, the next reference to the church in, uh, in the New Testament after Matthew 16 is found in Matthew chapter 18. So go over to Matthew chapter 18, look at verse number 17. And if he shall neglect to hear them, and this is two or three witnesses, and they're having a, having a problem, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Now, I don't think there's any doubt that this is Christ's command for the early church that was being founded. You know, I don't know. Some people want to make a huge deal about exactly the day that the church was founded. I don't know. Seems to me like Jesus is started the church and is already bringing in the, the, the apostles and disciples to, to continue to build that church. And by the time you get to Acts chapter 2, I don't believe the church is already in complete existence with the Holy Spirit being brought in and so on. Um, but here in verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 17, I think there's no doubt that this is in reference to church discipline. Okay? What is Jesus doing? He's instituting church discipline. How can you have a church if you don't exercise 
discipline in that church, if you don't have a way of keeping the church pure, if you don't have a way of, of uh, keeping those people faithful to God and having an avenue where if someone is not faithful, and, and we're talking obviously in things that the Bible mentions, immorality and, and false doctrine and so on, of weeding out those church members who don't want to be a part of Jesus Christ's church. There's this spiritual vitamin of church discipline. Um, I think it's very interesting there. Uh, on page number 30, if you're in your book, that's fine if you're not. But uh, the, the Bible says in Psalm 22, verse 22, that in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And Psalm 22, of course, is a messianic psalm in Jesus Christ, uh, uh, very clearly throughout that entire psalm. And the only time that we ever see Jesus singing was right after the Lord's Supper. He instituted the Lord's Supper, and then they sang a song and went out to the Mount of Olives. I think that's a reference to Jesus singing in the church. The point is that the church is already there. Jesus, his disciples, minus one, right? Because Judas had just walked out. So Jesus there in the church, in his group of believers, is singing that song. And I think that's a very interesting point. Church discipline, what had they just done? He walked Judas to the door. Not literally, but that's, you know, he, he, he pushed him out. Said, look. Go do what you're going to do. What thou doest, do quickly. Get with it. I, I think that's at least, a, in part, a reference here to church discipline. But regardless, in, uh, it, in Acts chapter 20, Paul warns the Ephesian elders about those wolves within the church. And there's many, many references to church discipline. The pastor in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, has to be on the watch for things in Titus chapter 1 and many references to the pastor, the under-shepherd, uh, watching for the wolves within the flock and so on. The Bible is even very explicit on pastors who go off into sin and false doctrine. Um, the Bible says, Rebuke not an elder... But before two or three witnesses, what is it saying? There is certainly a place to rebuke an elder. Uh, I think, you know, Caleb's dad is a pastor, so I always kind of think of him, but nobody else's dad is a pastor, right? No. Um, but I, so I always think of him, but, uh, you know, what kind, of a, what kind of a church would you have if your pastor didn't lead this way? But, oh, oh back to my, what I was thinking. I lost my train of thought. Rebuke not an elder, Certainly, that, is a, that keeps you honest with the people and with God, knowing that if you don't do your job as an elder, that uh, there are repercussions for that. Most certainly. So, church discipline, a, a, a vital aspect of the New Testament church. Jesus instituted church discipline, I believe, very early on, in the church age, even, even before the Holy Spirit was given to the church on a, on a continual basis, he instituted church discipline in Matthew chapter 18. So it's absolutely vital. Now, does it happen every week? Of course not. Does it happen every month? Of course not. Um, but does it happen occasionally? Yes, unfortunately it does, and it needs to. Um, how often do you have surgery? <laughs> on your body, hopefully not very often, right? Because if you do, there's, you got serious problems, continuing problems. But every so often, every, you know, sometimes people have to have surgery. It's the same thing with the church. It's cutting out that leaven. Remember Paul warned about in 1 uh, Corinthians. Um, did, did the churches, did the early New Testament churches have uh, problems to be dealt with. Absolutely. What did Paul say about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, about that man at, at Corinth? He said, turn him over to Satan. It's church discipline. And on and on, uh, there's place for it. Next, Jesus also instituted 
building the church through the vitamin of the Lord's Supper. That's the next building block that Jesus instituted into his ecclesia. All right, uh, the book mentions that Matthew, Mark, Luke, all those three Gospels reference this uh, details of the Lord's Supper. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 records the details of the Lord's Supper. So Paul interprets the Lord's Supper the same way that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. It was a commemoration. It was a symbol of something, not, not a method of, you know, of getting to heaven or anything like that. So the, uh, the Lord's Supper was instituted to build up and to strengthen the believers. So should we have it every week? That's, that's what the early church did. The, the Bible says in Acts that they were breaking bread. Uh, that doesn't mean they were sitting down to eat. That means they were sitting down and having, commemorating every week the Lord's Supper. Can you think of some dangers of doing it every week? Caleb? It becomes just a ritual of something that... Like the Catholics, right? It becomes a ritual. So if you do it... And here we do it very unexpectedly. We're like, we're not, we don't tell everybody that we're going to have it. But that's, that's just the way we do it. Some churches, they announce it a couple services in advance or whatever. Hey, we're having the Lord's Supper. It's a special time. That's great. Um... Anyway, so there's different ways of doing it, but the Bible says, as oft as ye do it. It doesn't say how many times it's supposed to be done, but as oft as ye do it, do it in remembrance of me. And so this builds up a church. It certainly is a useful tool to strengthen the church. Third, the next spiritual vitamin the Lord gave is the Great Commission. What is a church? Think about this. What is a church without a purpose? Isn't that it? The, the Great Commission is the purpose of the church. That gives us a reason to, uh, to uh, do what we do. We've got a job. We have something to do. What is the church without the Great Commission? Dead. <laughs> Dead. They're, they're not doing anything. And the people are going to die. I remember when, when our family first got saved and we started going to a Baptist church. Um, the church was very dead. They weren't doing anything. There was no soul winning. And all of a sudden, in a little church of about 50 people, we added 35 or so newly saved people. Ooh, boom. You, you think about how happy your dad would be. <laughs> We've often thought about that. You know that uh, here's five families just got freshly saved and have, you know, as a whole, they had character, they, had, they were hard workers, and we were excited about being saved. So, you know, we're all sitting at the front of the church and all the old backsliders are sitting in the back. It was pretty funny. Uh, just a huge, you know, about half, almost half the church was excited and wanted to go soul winning. What is that purpose? And, and a church that doesn't have the Great Commission right at the forefront of their purpose is a lost, dying, or dead church. And so this is a spiritual... I remember... Uh, Dr. Vogelin, the preacher who started this church, uh, he, right after college, he took a small church in Pennsylvania or South Carolina or somewhere, he took a small church, and they were fighting and nothing but trouble. And the deacons were mad at each other, and everybody was wanting to kill each other pretty much. And God led him to get the people busy soul winning. Just go soul winning. Get them active. What is that? The Great Commission. Get them busy, uh, and they'll, they'll quit their fighting. They'll realize there's more to life than uh, uh, seeing who can uh, control you know, the color of the carpet and so on. So what's the church's job? The Great Commission. What is that? It's not just soul winning. It's baptizing them. It's uh, adding them to the church and discipling them. And I just love this, uh, the thoughts here on page 32. Uh, Peter preached to the unsaved Jews in Acts chapter 2. They responded by being saved, baptized, and added to the church. Paul went to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And what happened there? Uh, people, once he got saved, then he became a part of the church at Damascus. 
There was a church at Antioch that, the pe that God was working through that church. Paul went on his missionary journeys. And everywhere he went, he started churches. Don't tell me that God doesn't work through the local church. He certainly does. The Great Commission is not a commission given to a home church or anything like that. It's not a commission given to a denomination. It's given to a bunch of local churches. And those local churches are supposed to reach their, as we say, their Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. All churches should be involved in this great commission. Teaching them, baptizing them, and discipling them. And so if a church doesn't do that, they're not going to, be, they're not going to survive. They're going to die. Um, Paul's three missionary journeys are filled with examples of discipling, baptizing, instructing people, the Gentiles, of course, primarily, uh, but also a lot of Jews. And this is the way it should be. The Great Commission is so an important vitamin for the edification of the church. And then the fourth one is the edification with the giving of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, that takes place in Acts chapter 2. Let me uh, point out a couple things. Um, the, the Old Testament times, even though we don't live under that uh, time period, and I understand that things were different in the Old Testament times, in that dispensation, we do live in a time uh, where it's important to understand the Old Testament. And, and I just want to point out a couple of things. And in fact, if you would, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I want to point out, though, that uh, when Jesus, I'm sorry, when God sends His Holy Spirit into a place and approves of that place by so doing, by sending His Spirit, that the glory of the Lord fills the place. Think about uh, here in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost is fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. All right, let me just mention two other times in the Bible, both of them in the Old Testament, when the presence of God came upon a place. And I, my point will be, I think, pretty clear. Look at Exodus chapter 40. This is the time when the tabernacle is, is being built and completed. Exodus chapter 40, verse number 1. Uh, that's where it starts the, the talking about the tabernacle. Uh, let me give you the actual passage. Verse 34, all the way down to the end. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. So what happened? When God's presence filled the tabernacle, they, 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 they knew it. They saw His presence. It was the glory of the Lord filling the place. Okay, go to 1 Kings now. 1 Kings, we'll see in chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. That tabernacle that had been the dwelling place of God for many years was now being replaced with the temple, with Solomon's temple. Verse 10. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, And it came to pass when the priests would come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Well, so the tabernacle was filled with the presence of God. The temple was filled with the presence of God. And now here in Acts chapter 2, we see that his church receives the presence of God. And it's the same effects, some of the same effects. Uh, there's a cloud, covers the place, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So understand, God put His blessing and His approval on the church. 
So we have this spiritual vitamin uh, of the Holy Spirit being given to the church. And I think that's very important to understand. Um, Ezekiel 43, the book tell, our textbook tells us, that in the future, that temple of the millennium is also going to be uh, approved and it's going to have the presence of the Lord in it. So I don't know if the Jews have it right that uh, they've, you know, they're collecting stuff already. Did you know that there's a whole organization collecting things for the future temple? Um, I don't know if they have it all right. But I do know that there will be a temple and I do know also according to the prophecy that that temple will have the blessing of God upon it and His approval. So right now, we live in a church age. And the church has the Holy Spirit to edify it. And so we have to understand that. We have to live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. And uh, that will bring the blessing of God upon the church. Okay? So this baptism of the Holy Spirit had been prophesied Many, many times already. By the way, let me just point out this very important understanding. Uh, the Pentecostals of today talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As if that means you speak in tongues. And the Bible never says that. Uh, there was speaking in tongues, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. Let me point out to you some passages in the Gospels. Each of the Gospels, by the way, mention the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Go back in your, in your Bible to Matthew. I want to point this out real quick. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Jesus said here, and by the way, I know this is all the same account. I understand that. But my point is still that each of the writers of the Gospels, all four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mention what Jesus said about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, John the Baptist speaking, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Mark chapter 1, verse 8. Mark chapter 1, verse 8. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Luke records this for us as well. John answered, I indeed baptize you with water. Going down to the end of the verse, He, Jesus, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And then also in John chapter 1, verse 33, John also records this. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with the water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So, all of the uh, writers of the Gospels testify to this fact. Now go to the book of Acts, chapter 1. And this is, I believe, the angels. No, this is Jesus, sorry. Telling the disciples at Jerusalem immediately before he went to heaven. Look what he said in verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost soon. Now, I just translated. Not many days hence. You're going to be baptized with the, the Holy Ghost in a few days. And we know that was the case, don't we? How many days later? Jesus went back to heaven. How many days later? Oh. Okay. okay. Ten days, right? Remember, Jesus went back to heaven 40 days after the crucifixion. On the 50th day after the crucifixion, the crucifixion was on the day of Pentecost. Sorry, not the day of Pentecost. The crucifixion on the day of the Passover. 50 days later is the Pentecost feast. And on that day, the Holy Spirit would come. Ten days later was Jesus right. He said in a few days, not many days hence, next week, <laughs> you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And then we find in John, uh, Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Ghost came upon the church. So this baptism of the Holy Ghost, this giving of the Holy Spirit was an event. It was a one-time event. It's not something that you can experience today. 
you already have him. When, you know, I, I guess if, if you want to be uh, technical, when you got saved, when you were saved, you were baptized with the Holy Ghost. You received the Holy Spirit. You have his power to live by. You can have the fruit of the Spirit. You can walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. On and on. So uh, the Holy Spirit was given to the church. He's our gift. Remember how Jesus in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, he basically told the disciples, I have a gift for you. It's the Holy Spirit. So these are vitamins. What other things? The book mentions a couple other things in middle page 37. Deacons were given to the church to help the church grow. Spiritually, I'm not talking in numbers, but to help the church grow spiritually. Uh, deacons were given so the pastors could have more time to do what they needed to do so the deacons could do these other more menial responsibilities, ordinary responsibilities. Deacons were given. Rest from persecution was a part of edifying the church. Apostolic teaching. Paul's writings and teachings, right? All of Paul's writings, uh, John's writings, Peter's writings. These were apostles that wrote to edify the church. And I didn't look at, the de at the, any details, examples of this. But there's at least 10 times where Paul says, I'm doing this for your edification. What was he doing? He was edifying the church. God used Paul and the other apostles to edify his church. So uh, God has a lot of interest, a vested interest in the church. All right, let's move on. I need to cover one more section, and that is the uh, characteristics of the faith. And it's a totally different section. I'm going to call this the characteristics of the faith that was delivered to the saints. So this is... Uh, of course, we're talking about the church. We're talking about the early church. And I promise you, after this test, we're going to start going into church history. Uh, right now, we're still in Bible church history, right? We haven't left the New Testament yet. Um, First Timothy, there's a lot of passages that talk about the faith that was delivered to the saints. Uh, Jude, verse 3, is a very common known verse. Jude right before Revelation. And that was for myself, not for you. Jude verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Okay, so we're going to call this a section on the characteristics of this faith that was delivered to the saints. Let's see some of the major can we call them essentials? Right? Do you know what I'm talking about there? Not the non-essentials. Non-essentials, you know, I'm kidding, because a lot of, a lot of uh, churches today, even Baptist churches, say we need, to come, we need to be willing to combine and compromise with other churches on the non-essentials. And, of course, the non-essentials are, you know, music and dress standards and so on like that. They don't, uh, they're giving up the faith. But uh, what are some of these characteristics of this faith that was delivered to the saints? Which, by the way, um, th this idea in Jude verse 3 goes against Mary Baker Eddy, who claimed to have all these extra-biblical revelations. God told me that uh, you're supposed to, all of you are supposed to take me to Dairy Queen <laughs> for a good old ice cream, but... Uh, especially God told me that you're supposed to pay for it, so on. God gave me new revelations, and you know it doesn't really matter that what I'm saying goes against the Bible, because He gave this is this supersedes the Bible because it's been given recently, you know, like last night after I had a bunch of pizza and I had this new revelation. I'm kidding. So these new revelations, no, no, no. The Bible says. We should contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's been delivered. We have it. It's right here. 
It's not in some person's mind. It's not in some person's new revelation. Even if they write a new book, it's not in that book. It's been delivered already and we need to contend for it. So that faith is unchanging. These are characteristics that we can't just randomly pick and choose throughout what we don't like. 1 Timothy 3.16, sorry. 1 Timothy 6.13, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. All these passages talk about this faith. Just think, you know, I just thought of this. Think about the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, you preach the gospel, you baptize them, and teach them all things. Whoa, we have it then. If Jesus told us to teach and to make disciples, how do we make disciples? We make disciples from what's already been given. We already have it. We're not looking for something new. You understand? So, uh, I don't, I don't like it. Oh, I, you know, obviously, what I think doesn't matter, really. The truth is that anybody who comes out with these new teachings or new revelations, it doesn't matter what they say, really, because they're going against the Bible. We already have God's, uh, you know, the faith that's been delivered. We already have God's word in the form of doctrine. Okay, so let me give you a bunch of things that I believe are found in the, in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, that have been given to the church. And throughout church history, we're going to see many of these violated and many of these doctrines thrown by the wayside. Number one, scriptures are the sole authority for faith and practice. Jesus Christ, his apostles, exalted the authority of scriptures. Can you think of something that Jesus often said, exalting the scriptures? <laughs> what did you like to say? All right. All right. It is written. It is written. What is he doing? He's lifting up the Old Testament scriptures. Um, I always love, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament is Luke chapter 24. And that's the story of the road to Emmaus, those two disciples thinking that, uh, you know, the world had come to an end because the person they had believed in, Jesus Christ, he, they thought for sure he's going to be a king now. And, and he had been killed at the hands of the Jews and the Romans. And so they're all depressed and everything, poor guys. Uh, actually, one of them was probably a woman. So it's the way they, uh, man and a woman. Anyway, so they're walking along and Jesus shows up. And Jesus gently and nicely starts to reason with them. You know, he, in the Bible says he started at the Old Testament all the way at Moses and the prophets and the writings. He went through the Old Testament. And I can just picture Jesus saying, didn't, Psalm 22 say that Jesus was going to be forsaken by his brethren and by his God. Did, weren't you at the cross or close enough? You heard him say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's Psalm 22, verse 1, <laughs> uh, and on and on. Don't you, didn't you see what happened to Jesus when he was on the cross? And all, I mean, He's just relating to them how Jesus fulfilled the scriptures of the Old Testament. And the Bible says, in all the scriptures, he expounded unto them the things concerning himself, but they didn't know it was him. What is he doing? He's lifting up the scriptures. He exalted the scriptures. Uh, many other passages. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says to Timothy, all scripture is given. Paul's lifting up the scriptures. In uh, First or 2 Peter, I forget the exact passage, Peter refers to the beloved brother Paul's writings as Scripture. So, and there's a couple great points there that, you know, because the critics of the Bible always like to think of the, the older it is, the better it is. Well, Peter and Paul are contemporaries. In fact, they didn't always get along. <laughs> Remember uh, Galatians chapter 2? Peter was rebuked of the apostle Paul. 
But then in Peter in his writings, a number of years later, says, the beloved brother Paul, his writings are scripture. Right? What are they doing? They're lifting up the scripture. They exalted the scriptures. There are Baptist churches today that don't lift up the scriptures anymore. They say that in their doctrinal statement, but they don't lift up the scriptures. When you have a pastor, when you have a preacher get up and say, you can close your Bibles tonight because I need to preach to you. Uh, write that man down. He's not a Bible believer. Uh, churches are supposed to be filled with the Word of God, the Scriptures. Secondly, we've got to move on. Salvation is by grace alone through faith. Salvation is by grace alone through faith. Um, there was some question in the early church about, are, are you sure this is, salvation is not through some works? There was some question about that. In the church at Jerusalem, and lo and behold, Paul comes back from the mission field and goes to the church of Jerusalem, who is the pastor at Jerusalem. It was James. James is the pastor. Paul, Peter, James, a number of the apostles in Acts chapter 15 go to Jerusalem and they said, no, 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 no. The Jews are trying to say that you, have to be, that you have to be a legitimate Jew, circumcision. And if you're not that, if you're not circumcised, you're not a legitimate Jew, and therefore you can't be a Christian. You can't be saved. And Paul said, no, 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 no. You know, I can picture him saying the same thing to them that he said in Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? Where's, your, where's this other gospel coming from? It came from... Uh, uh, oh, what's the word? Uh, the Gnostics. It came from false teachers who were spreading these lies, saying that you had to still have a Jewish identity in order to be saved. And so Paul destroyed it. Salvation is by grace alone. And so Paul attacked that doctrine, false doctrine, very quickly in Acts chapter 15, in the early church at Jerusalem. And there would continue to be many more, and of course, we have what we have today. Many, many false doctrines. Grace and works cannot be mixed. That is something we cannot give up ever. No works. I like how Pastor Damon said it. Uh, uh, you can't take your own gods and line them up. You know, you can't take God and put him in the line with all of your other gods. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You can't take your works and promote yourself. Oh, no. It's only through the work of Christ. Third, another characteristic of the faith that's been delivered to the saints is a regenerate church membership. Church members are only saved people. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 is one great example. This is one of the first times right after the day of Pentecost. Actually, it is the first time right after the day of Pentecost. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So what should we do? I guess we should uh, maybe have these nice, cute little uh, pink and blue uh, baby Bibles, New Testaments. And then you can give that to an infant and they receive it and chew on it and, you know, slobber all over it. So they received his word. Then you can baptize those infants. Is that what it's talking about? <laughs> Obviously not. Then they that received his word were baptized. See how the Catholic Church doesn't believe this. And most denominations today don't believe this. Anybody who baptizes infants clearly doesn't believe this. A regenerate church membership. You can't have a member of a church who, and I'll, I'll, anyway, you can't have a member of a church who's not saved. Now, did Jesus in his early group, church, if you want to call it that, of his disciples, did he have a false profession in his membership? Of course he did. Judas. Are there always false professors in every church? Absolutely. I believe that. But, 
The church shouldn't openly receive in people who are clearly not believers. Just because you dump some water on a baby doesn't make them a believer, (laughs) as you well know. Okay, so those who profess Christ, and and we can talk a lot of other details, you know, do they have to do certain things in order to become a member? You know, we're not talking about that. Those are those non-essentials, if you will. Those are things that you can argue about. But whether they're saved or not, that's pretty obvious. Number four, the eternal security of the believer. We can't give on that one. Eternal security for the believer. Was Jesus pretty clear on somebody, uh, once they're saved, they're always saved? Can you think of a passage where Jesus talked about that? There's one famous one. It's in John. Anyone? Has to do with sheep. What what chapter is that? You Bible scholars. Try John chapter 10, right? 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Uh, I think Jesus believed in eternal security for the believer. And what about Paul? Did Paul believe it? <laughs> uh, what about John, right? 1 John 5, 13. Um, yes, these people believed in eternal security. Um, Anyone who professes, just because someone professes Christ doesn't mean they have eternal security. But everyone who receives Christ has eternal security. You understand my point there, my distinction? Just because someone says they have Christ doesn't mean they're saved, and that, does, that means they don't necessarily have eternal security. But if they truly believe they do have eternal security, no question about it. Number five. Another characteristic, I have about five more after this still, so hang with me. Number five, the church has two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Should I be more specific? Believer's baptism, not infant baptism. Scriptural baptism or is for believers only, and it's for... Or, 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 and it's only by immersion. I'm in the book of Acts already, so let me just turn over into uh, Acts chapter 8. This is one of those uh, obvious passages. Here we have Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Verse 38. Sorry, verse 36. The the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest, thou mayest. With all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He put his faith in Christ alone. That was it. None of his own gods that he had before. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water... So what did they do? He believed, he went in the water, he baptized, and then they came up out of the water. That's believer's baptism by immersion. They must be baptized. In Acts chapter 2, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So the church has these two ordinances. Baptism, that's one. Believer's baptism by immersion. And the Lord's Supper. We practice the Lord's Supper. Now, are there different ways of practicing the Lord's Supper? Right? You might as well have a big meal and have a bunch of wine. No, I'm kidding. That's not one of the ways. (laughs) Caleb is getting excited over here. Um, Unleavened bread and grape juice. And not a meal. Paul was very specific about that. If you want to eat, go home. (laughs) Make some food at home. You know, if your wife's that bad of a cook, get somebody else to cook for you. I'm kidding. Um, That's not me. My wife cooks just fine for me. As you can tell, I'm always having to go on a diet. Anyway, 
But um, uh, the Lord's Supper, Lord's Supper, a little bit of grape juice, a little bit of unleavened bread. It's a memorial. It's a memory of the death, burial, the resurrection of Christ, what He did for us. All right, so that's pretty obvious. Those two things. Not, you know, there, there's some who claim foot washing. Okay, Jesus told His disciples at that last supper, He went down and washed their feet, and He said, you should do this to the other disciples. You ought to... In other words, his point was, we believe, of uh, being a servant to each other. You be a servant to each other. No. But he never instituted that as, as, a, uh, as an ordinance. And it doesn't show in any way the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I mean, I know somebody's feet might stink so bad that you might die or something. Uh, in the men's dorm, we definitely believe in that. But I'm kidding. But the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is not shown in that. Also, what's another reason we shouldn't practice the, the, uh, the foot washing? Anybody think of another good reason? Let's think. Church at Colossae. Is there any evidence of them practicing foot washing? Go through the list. Any other churches? Is it, okay, the first church at Jerusalem. What did they do? They baptized people. They had the Lord's Supper. You see evidences of that in Acts chapter 2 and all the way through chapter 5. People being saved, baptized, and the Lord's Supper. Breaking of bread. Where do you see them washing each other's feet? Okay, so that's the point. You never see any other church, any church, period, washing feet as one of the ordinances. So it's important to understand that. Two ordinances, baptism or supper, both of them picture the death and the suffering of Christ and resurrection and so on. We've got to move on. Number six, the independence and autonomy of the church. The independence and autonomy of the church. Remember, I couldn't think of that word earlier in the year. Um, that simply means that the church is autonomous, it's independent. It does what God tells us to do because Christ is the head of that individual church. He's not the head of a denomination. He's not the head of an organization. He's the head of the church. Let me give you, I'm in the book of Acts here, Acts chapter 14, which by the way, the book of Acts is a model book on how God was uh, establishing the churches, the early churches, and working through those early churches. And so th this is a model. It's the Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> Who are the Apostles? The ones God used to found and establish the churches. Jesus Christ is the main, is the founder, the head. But He used these Apostles to do it. And all through the book of Acts, you see these Apostles, early leaders in the church, working through churches, establishing churches. So the book of Acts is really about the beginning of the church, the beginnings of the church. Then you get to the Pauline writings and the other apostolic writings of the New Testament, and you constantly see references to the, that church again. It's the edification of the church that we talked about earlier. But here in Acts chapter 14, for example... Verse 23, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. This is Paul. After his first journey, he gets kind of to the end and he starts working his way back out now of Asia Minor, retracing his steps to each of the churches, ordaining elders and making sure these churches are established. So what is he, what is he doing? Church at Iconium had their own pastor. It was the Iconium Baptist Church. Or the Iconium Church. And they, weren't, they weren't Baptists at that, and they didn't have that name. There's the Lystra Church. They had been through a lot. Uh, Paul had gotten stoned there. There were some very hateful Jews there. Uh, no, sorry, not Jews. Uh, pagans there. 
um, Thessalonica, where the worst, most hateful Jews were. But uh, what is this? Each church, they went back, retracing their steps. Or did, why didn't Paul just maintain authority over all of these churches? Because he wasn't the head. He ordained elders so that those churches would be independent and autonomous. In fact, some of these churches sent out their own missionaries. That's how autonomous they were. Lystra sent Timothy to help Paul. Philipp Philippi, the church at Philippi, sent Epaphroditus. And on and on. There's a number of others. Um, Tychicus. <laughs> Shoo, that was hard. There's a lot of these uh, very interesting names. But Ephesians and Philippians mention some of these people, their own missionaries that were sent out. So these are independent churches. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, what did Jesus do there? Seven churches of Asia, and he said that each of the churches had their own angel. And he specifically says that the angel is the pastor. What is he saying? You know, uh, maybe it should have been John, Right? At that time in Revelation, John is, I think, the only apostle left. And so John should have been the, uh, the elder over all of these churches, right? No. John is not mentioned as, any, as an elder over any of those churches. It was the individual angels of the churches, which was the pastor of the church. And so that's the way uh, God built these churches, through the, uh, the independence and autonomy he established in those churches. Number seven, the priesthood of the believers. The priesthood of the believers. Right now, there is no official priesthood after any order. It's a general priesthood. There have been priesthoods in the past under specific orders. So the Catholics are way, way off base here um, in claiming priesthood through some line. The Pope, the papal line, oh no, there is no priesthood except the priesthood of the believer. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter's very clear on this. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to Christians, believers in general. It's very clear if you look at the context of that. He's speaking to, to uh, uh, believers. In Hebrews 3, verse 1, probably written by Paul, written to the, to the Hebrews, to the Jews, and he says that Jesus Christ is the high priest in chapter 3, verse 1. And all of chapter 2 and chapter 3 about this priesthood, and even more so later on, um, that Jesus Christ is the priest, is the high priest. And the believers are the priesthood. The apostles of Jesus were never called priests. They were never called priests. They were, you know, uh, I mean, the people occasionally, you know, who say that they're apostles or women who say they're apostles. Actually, I thought women were supposed to be epistles. No, I'm kidding. The apostles and their wives were the epistles, right? I've heard all those jokes. But um, apostles are never called priests. They're pastors. There are pastors. They're believers. They're deacons. There's never priests in the, the local churches in the New Testament. Number eight. Another very important characteristic of this faith, I believe, is that they believed in separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. Now, that's our modern-day phrase. But just understand that these, uh, uh, these apostolic churches were always separate from the government. They were always separate from the government. In fact, they usually went in opposition to the government. <laughs> right? Especially in the early days under the Roman Empire. They were in opposition to the government. It wasn't until Constantine came along that the church came under the same head as the government. And so obviously that was never the intent uh, for the true churches. And by the way, it never has been the case for true churches. 
that they were not under the authority of the government. True churches, all apostolic, biblical churches, always were separated from the government. Uh, and they were very clear. The first pope, Peter, said, I'm saying that facetiously, the first pope, Peter, said, we must obey God rather than men. <laughs> that means God comes before government. Now, he was saying that to the government at Jerusalem. The first pope said that. Okay, he wasn't the first pope. All right, I understand. All right, one, two more things. Another characteristic of this faith is that they believed in liberty of conscience. Liberty of conscience. The early church didn't try to force, like the Catholic Church does, and the Lutherans, and the Anglicans, and, you know, you get the point. Uh, the early church didn't force people to believe. How do you force somebody to believe? They didn't force people. They didn't compel them to come in, as Augustine believed. The early church believed in liberty of conscience, that, that it should be a free choice. It's your free will. So what, is the church, what did the early church do? They went out and persuaded people to become Christian. They, they, they you know, don't call, you know, whatever you want to call it. They didn't put pressure on them. They told them the truth and the Holy Spirit convicted them and they were persuaded to be saved. Churches do have some authority within their membership. You know, there's church discipline. Um, pastors are supposed to take the lead in these things. You know, the church at Corinth was uh, doing, they weren't kicking out who they should have kicked out. And they're uh, keeping people in their church that needed to be gone and so on. Anyway, they, they were doing a lot of things that were wrong. But that's within the church. But as far as our work in discipling and reaching the lost, reaching the lost and discipling them, is that they have a, they have a choice. Liberty of conscience. There's no idea at all in the scriptures of forcing people to become Christian. Number 10. They also believed in separation from false teaching. Separation from false teaching. One of the themes of the New Testament epistles is the danger of false teaching. A true New Testament church doesn't overlook error and apostasy. They take a stand against those things. So make sure you understand these are characteristics of the faith that have been delivered to the saints. We have them. They're in the scriptures. And we ought to follow it. And we ought to stand on that and, and prize those things. It ought to be special to us that this, this is what makes up our church. It's what makes up your home churches in Oshkosh. That's your church. And, and so you ought, to st you ought to protect that church. And these are things that we believe because the Bible teaches them. And in all of your churches as well. So uh, I hope you'll understand that and, and value those things.